Good evening. Welcome to this, this meeting of the Development Management Com Committee. There's a bit of an echo on the. Is it? Somebody got a mic, Mum. I'll, I'll I'll keep speaking. See if it goes away. Okay. I'll just go through the preliminaries first. Okay. Members of the public are entitled to take photographs, film, audio record and report on all public meetings in accordance with the openness of local government bodies, Regulation 2014. People may not, however, act in any way considered to be disruptive and may be asked to leave. Notice if these rights will be given verbally at the meeting as appropriate. This meeting is being live streamed tonight and will be recorded. The emergency evacuation procedure from the county chamber Turn left, follow the green emergency exit signs to the main town hall entrance and proceed to the assembly point at St George's Square. I'll go straight onto the agenda now. Any apologies for absence? Uh, yes, Chair, apologies from Councillor Kershid. The minutes of the previous meeting. There's one slight amendment, isn't there, Councillor Franks, to do with the Della Road application? Yeah, but that to reduce that time limit to one year. Yeah, that'll be that'll be duly recorded. Section 106 of the Local Government Finance Act. None that I'm aware of, Chair. Any declarations of interest tonight? Councillor Bridgen. Yes, Chair, thank you. Um, in relation to item number nine, um, I'll declare a personal and prejudicial interest. I'm a season ticket holder um, at Luton Town Football Club. And hence... You've been, you've been getting value for money this season from your season ticket, haven't you? <laughs> yeah, up to fifth. Yeah. OK. Um, I'm going to move the order around now. I'm going to take the power court applications first. Uh, Councillor, oh, Councillor Campbell is back. So I'll, I'll outline the procedure. I'll ask the, the officer, David Hall, to introduce the report. And then I'll ask questions from members. Then the applicants um, will get their chance to speak. I know it's five minutes of the new rule, but I consider this to be a major application. So I will uh, extend the speaking time, OK? And I'll decide when I start to yawn, then you'll know I've had enough. <laughs> so we'll go straight on to power call. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this planning application seeks permission for a mixed use development comprising residential floor space, appropriate town centre uses, including a health centre, retail community uses, food and drinking establishments, car and cycle parking and associated access, highways, utilities, public realm, landscaping, river works and associated ancillary works. There is an update on this item which has been provided in the update sheet. Uh, in addition to the foregoing, members should be aware of some further updates which have come forward since the preparation of the update sheet. Uh, if I could take you to recommendation 2B3, uh, this reads uh, towards the end of that recommendation that planning permission is granted subject to the satisfactory completion of a legal agreement or appropriate mechanism with the following head of terms. The first uh, bullet point refers to the phasing of the comprehensive development of the stadium and added to that and community and commercial uses, including the submission of a phasing plan. Members should also note that the reference to transport highways, waste, education museums and CCTV relates to contributions payment. On recommendation 2B4 on page 80, this should read, delegated authority is granted to the head of planning and adding to add or delete any conditions and to make minor alterations to the conditions and following any committee resolution to grant permission should any be required. On pa paragraph 355 of page 143, a figure of 2.1 million has been agreed for highway improvement works necessitated by the development. However, in order to ensure that these funds are most effectively allocated, delegated power is sought for the head of planning to finalise distribution of these funds. Paragraph 357 on page 143, the level of museum contribution is the subject of ongoing discussions. 
Once a figure has been agreed, delegated authority is sought for the head of planning to include such a figure within the Section 106 agreement. Similar situation applies in respect of paragraph 359, where a figure for the CCTV contribution has not been received. So again, delegated authority is sought for the head of planning to include such a figure once received. Turning now to the conditions, condition 02 on page 150, this is to be amended. So in the, uh, the condition should read, the proposed development shall be carried out in general conformity with the parameter plans submitted therewith for the avoidance of doubt, the approved plans and then the plans as are listed. So the wording in all respects in accordance with parameters approved by this application and are deleted. In terms of condition 19 on page 154, the last sentence has been altered to read, the scheme shall be carried out as approved, deleting account of the words account for any comments made. So the sentence will read, this scheme shall be carried out as approved by the local planning authority before the development hereby permitted is first occupied. Condition 37 on page 161, the words for a minimum period of 10 years are deleted and substituted with the words in perpetuity. So the condition in this penultimate sentence would read, the maintenance schedule shall be in perpetuity shall be in perpetuity and include details of the arrangements for its implementation. On condition 46 on page 164, the condition will start the framework travel plan. So in addition to the comments set out in the opening words are deleted. In addition, the words after for approval would be added, which so it would read for approval should include the following measures. On condition 53, page 164, the wording is altered, so no development of phase two shall take place until the applicant has entered into a section 278 agreement. So the words which affects the public highways, such shall commence until are deleted. And the wording would conclude and the said authority has approved in writing full details of working works affecting the public highway which are then listed as per the report an additional condition is added uh, which will become condition 54 which is that a management plan for the development including management responsibilities and maintenance schedules for all internal external and shared common areas of development including the bin store and cycle parking areas post and letterbox arrangements shall be submitted in writing to the local planning authority for approval prior to the occupation of the development or any phase of the development for its permitted use. The management plan shall be carried out as approved and shall remain in force for as long as the development remains in existence. The reason for the condition is to ensure a satisfactory standard of development and to safeguard the amenities of the surrounding area. Moving now on to the presentation per se. This application has been brought to committee as it is a major application. Members should note that the application is in outline with all matters reserved for subsequent approvals save for access. As such, the reserved matters to be considers, considered would comprise appearance, landscaping, layout and scale. If we could have the first slide, please. The application site is located in Luton Town Centre, northeast gateway bounded to the north by the route of the Luton Dunstable guided busway and to the south by St Mary's Road. The site is comprised of west and east elements with the land sandwiched between being the site for the proposed football stadium. Next slide, please. As the application is in outline form only with all matters safe for access reserved for subsequent approval, this plan indicates the access proposals for the site, which on the western side are from St Mary's Road and to the east from Crawley Green Road and the St Mary's Road roundabout. Next slide, please. Members will be aware that the application benefits from the grant of planning permission under 1601400. This slide sets out the extent of the current proposals. If I could have the next slide, please. 
From this slide, members will see the elements of the extent of the extent planning permission, which are maintained, varied and in excluded. So you'll see that the stadium is uh, excluded. The number of residential units is varied. An entertainment, music and conference venue is excluded. Uh, up to 2,800 square meters of, of educational community and communal commercial floor space is varied, as is the provision of entertainment. The hotel uh, provision is excluded and the extent of the retail and food and beverage floor space is varied. A food store is provided for with a flexible use for 5,600 square meters and up to 1,200 car parking spaces is maintained, as is the associated access works, utilities, public realm, etc. <clears throat> I could have the next slide, please. The application submissions provide a number of parameter plans to provide an illustration of the proposed development. This parameter plan shows an indicative site layout. On the west side of the site, there are four blocks, E and F, which front onto St Mary's Road, and blocks A and B, which are to the other side of what is proposed to be a piazza stroke plaza area. To the east is block G, similarly with a piazza area. The next slide, please. In order to demonstrate how the development could be accommodated on the application site, this slide shows the ground floor layout. On the western part of the site, the ground floor uses would provide an active frontage, which in the cases of blocks E and F will front onto St Mary's Road. To the rear of the said blo blocks are areas of residential amenity. These would be bin stores and the like. Blocks A and B are to the rear of these frontage units. To the rear of these blocks will be car parking. To the east is block G, where it is proposed to provide retail floor space with residential amenity areas and park car parking. Next slide, please. This slide gives an indication to members of the comparison between the uh, current proposal before you and the uh, development which uh, is an indicative layout of the extant planning permission. Next slide, please. The, a series of photo montages have been provided, and these illustrate how the development might appear from the street scene. The first illustration is from the corner of Church Street and St Mary's. On the left-hand slide is the uh, position pre-development. On the right side is the uh, envisaged post-development. Next slide, please. This is another uh, photo montage which shows views from Guilford Street in a similar format. And if I could have the final slide, please. The final slide um, also uh, draws together the um, general massing of how the development would look. And the next slide, please. And this slide gives a CGI illustration of how the development would look from Guildford Street. Next slide, please. The phasing plan indicates that Block E would come forward first for development with blocks, and that's the one in blue, with the other blocks A, B, F and G coming forward as a second phase. Next slide, please. This slide provides an illustrative master plan from which members will see within the parameter plan details of the extent of green space that would be provided. Such areas would be utilized by residents and would include balconies, podium gardens and roof terraces. Next slide, please. I think there's a slide before that. No. Okay. The River Lee is culvert, culverted for the majority of its course through the application site. The extant planning permission proposes to, to divert the River Lee along the site boundary with St Mary's Road. The current application proposes the deep culverting of the western end of the site uh, as well as the eastern end of the site. And the uh, deculverting would 
allow the Rivoli to be incorporated as part of the landscaping arrangement within the uh, within the Plaza Piazza area. Next slide, please. This uh, slide. Sorry, can you back one? So this is the the, wet, the western end, which, uh, as I've just described, shows the River Lee being exposed uh, within the uh, piazza area, um, providing a landscaped area in relation to the uh, building blocks that are uh, on part of the parameter plans. Next slide, please. The final slide provides uh, an illustrative scheme design showing both the western and eastern parts of the site and how the whole site would uh, merge together. Members will see from the report that the main planning considerations are the principle of development, highway transport access and parking considerations, as well as the design and the impact on the character and appearance of the area. The layout and living environment to be created in addition, the impact on the development on neighbouring amenity and issues relating to flooding, biodiversity, sustainability, crime prevention, planning obligations and other material considerations. In relation to the principle of development, the proposal is considered to be consistent with policy LLP9 of the local plan, which states that any scheme should include around 600 dwellings and a need for circa 3,393. No, sorry, 3,393 square metres net retail convenience floor space. Policy LLP9 does not cap the number of residential dwellings the site can provide, but provides an estimate of the likely number that should be provided. It is also a fact that the application site has been long identified with in planning policy as a site suitable to accommodate housing. And the council's evidence base identifies Power Court as a strategic site in terms of housing delivery. In addition, policy LLP3 states that Power Court and the Creative Quarter will contribute towards 2,100 new dwellings that will provide a significant contribution towards new homes in the borough and create an expanded residential community in the centre of Luton. The assessment has taken into account relevant development plan policies, the NPPF, information in an environmental statement and other environmental information. The impacts of the proposal are considerable and wide ranging. The proposed development would completely transform the site, providing a majority op a major opportunity to add to the ongoing regeneration of the borough. This would make a major positive contribution to wider strategic objectives of the development plan to promote regeneration of previously developed sites for the enhancement of the quality of life housing and employment opportunities and to attract new economic development encourage economic diversity. This would all be consistent with objectives one, two, three and nine of the adopted local plan. There are no significant land use constraints that would prohibit the proposal with the development being generally consistent with strategic policy framework for land uses. Power Court is a policy area site, policy LLP9. The overall scheme would create many jobs and would continue to ensure that spending in the borough by visitors and residents aiding local economic activity and growth would be maintained. The construction phase would create jobs over the build period, whilst the expanded operations and other commercial uses, plus the expected uh, expenditure of football supporters once the stadium is complete and new residents would raise permanent employment in the area. This would be consistent with policy LLP1. Other major issues relating to impacts from the proposal on the environment during construction are satisfactory, subject to the recommended planning obligations and conditions. One of the main issues is the impact of the uses on the transport network, including traffic on the adjacent roads, which includes strategic roads. Construction traffic is potentially disruptive given the scale and duration of the works, though it would not impact significantly on the road network and conditions requiring appropriate routing and management will minimise impacts. Infrastructure provision is critical to support the movement of significant numbers of people and a major benefit of the proposed location. Fundamentally, Power Court is perhaps the most accessible location in Luton. 
The, the siting of the development proposals to the east and west have to ensure the comprehensive development of the power court site, which will include a legal assurance that a stadium in this location will be delivered on a site where a multitude of transport choices exist, allowing the users of the development travel sustainability with as little impact across a wider number of modes and services as possible. The development proposals and proposed improvement mitigation measures will result in the proposed development being accommodated and managed sufficiently, so there are no significant adverse transport effects. There are no highway objections to the proposals. The proposed development is therefore consistent with policies LLP1 and LLP31 of the local plan. Effects on neighbours to the site are on, are on balance satisfactory in accordance with policies LLP LLP1, LLP25 and LLP38, with mitigation provided through conditions to limit impact from the uses proposed, including noise, air quality and lighting. Environmental conditions are satisfactory for the uses proposed, including new housing. The proposed development would make a significant contribution to the borough's supply of new housing. 20% affordable housing is proposed as part of the development, which would be policy compliant with LLP 16 of the local plan. Use of appropriate quality materials and sensitive refinement of the building's form and articulation, guided by a design code, which would be the subject of a condition, will ensure that the appearance of the development will be to a high standard. With regard to the townscape Im impact, in this case, there are positive impacts to the surrounding area and to the internal layout of the development. In particular, the following matters are addressed. Density. As a consequence of a reduction on the podium, rationalising of floor space, better space planning, this has allowed for an increase in the quantum of residential development with the approved parameter envelope within the approved parameter envelope, which is encouraged by both LLP 15 and by paragraph 124 of the NPPA. Space standards. All flats will be to nationally described space standards and amenity space would be provided via roof gardens, balconies and other outdoor amenity space. Building height. In terms of building heights, both the consented and proposed massing would make a similar contribution to the skyline. Parking. The rationale behind the level of parking would be to encourage residents to use highly accessible adjacent travel options and would attract new residents who already use sustainable modes of travel over the car. The River Lee. As set out in my narrative on the slides, the development differs from the development comprised within the extant planning permission. The current proposals maintain the River Lee's current course and would deculvert part of the River Lee through the site in a canalised channel integrated into the landscaping proposals. The EA subject conditions have no objections to this arrangement. The benefits of the development would result in sustainable development, which has three mutually dependent dimensions, economic, social and environmental. The main benefits of the scheme are social, providing up to 1,200 new dwellings, environment, reuse of previously developed site for a mix of uses, including housing, offsetting the need for greenfield development, regeneration of an unsightly brownfield land of low townscape value, thereby enhancing the appearance of the site. Creation of a new and enhanced public realm and new paving, street tree planting, lighting and pathways, all of which will enhance the permeability of the area linking places of interest to the surrounding area. Economic, significant contribution to the economic growth through increased employment and expenditure from new housing and commercial uses and opportunities for enhancement of skills and knowledge of local people through training initi initiatives. There is a need to secure mitigation measures and to restrict the proposals to the parameters assessed in both the environmental impact assessment and the details comprised in the planning application. This will be ensured by conditions. A section 106 agreement is also required to secure delivery of the stadium and its community benefits and other mitigation, including com necessary community structure. 
In the matter of the stadium and its community and commercial uses, members have made it clear that the delivery of the stadium is a fundamental part of the power court redevelopment. Indeed, without the certainty of the delivery of the stadium, this application would not of itself be acceptable. To address this, the applicants proposed to submit a phasing plan to provide for the construction of the stadium to commence prior to the commencing of phase two. Phase one it being block one, you may recall it uh, colored blue on the uh, phasing plan, which is the block at uh, the, uh, get my compass coordinates right here at the, I think it's at the uh, western end, but the easternmost block. So blocks A, B, F and G uh, will not be able to commence until uh, the, the as, well, they have to commence as part of the section, the stadium will have to commence as part of that section one agreement, six agreement. This development will give rise to an extensive range of positive impacts, which are considerable and widespread in their public benefit, including the, those that would allow, that would follow from securing the regeneration of the site, and the provision of a large number of new dwellings, new employment, new investment and spending in the area. There are two principal aspects in which the development has adverse impacts. Firstly, in breach of the local plan objectives for the town centre and the power court site, as the residential development of this site would displace the potential for a significant element of comparison retail development. This has to be considered, of course, on the basis that there is an extant planning permission, which is material in the consideration of this fact. Second, in relation to the impact on the relevant listed building, the proposal has had regard to Section 66 of the Listed Buildings and Conservation Area Act 1990, as set out in detail above. The development will cause less than substantial harm to heritage, heritage assets, a matter to which particular weight and importance must be given. It is for the Council to decide whether the public benefits of the proposal outweigh that harm. On the basis of the conclusion drawn from the, assess from the assessment provided to members, it is considered that the potential benefits resulting from the development are of a nature and scale as to outweigh the harm identified. Conclusion. The weight to give to, these, to all these matters is ultimately a decision for members. When considering this balance of impacts, it is highlighted that they must ensure that they take account of the information submitted with the environmental statement and the further information submitted, and in considering whether to grant planning permission for development which affects the listed building or its setting. Taking all these matters into account, balancing the social, environmental and economic benefits of the development against the residual harm, it is recommendation recommended that planning permission is granted subject to conditions, including the additional and amended conditions as set out in the updated report and included in this presentation and a section 106 legal agreement set out in the report. Thank you. Thanks, David. Are there any specific questions by members? You will get, you will get another opportunity to ask questions, make comments, but specifically on the presentation. That's the same. Number of questions uh, from the officers. Do we do we at this stage or after the? Uh, yeah, you, we will get an up, another opportunity. Yeah, okay. It's something that we've done in the past. Yeah. So I just thought we'd just continue it. In 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 terms of the one of the things you said, um, and could I be very clear that in in, in the section one hundred six agreement. What particular condition you're saying that the stadium will certainly be delivered in parallel with the rest of the development? Have I got that wrong or will it not be? The I mean, where, where does that condition fit into it in the, the 106? In agreement? order to assure delivery of the stadium. Yes a phasing plan is going to be provided by the applicants that phasing plan will set out the means by which the stadium will be delivered and that phasing plan as i you've set up it's up there on the the screen so mm -hmm. phase phase one is the area outlined in blue yeah. so phase one can can commence but the remaining phase two which includes all the other blocks 
will not be able to commence until the stadium has started. So that will be put in the Section 106 agreement to ensure that the stadium is delivered. Would that be in? We have. I haven't read that here somewhere. Have, have I missed it? It's. Uh, it's. It, I, I think that the the matter of the the phasing plan was part of the update that I gave at the the outset. Um, but that's that's what is proposed to ensure that the stadium is is delivered as part of this project. Because, as I said in my presentation, if the application as it stands at the moment um, was to come before members, then we would not be recommending permission because it would be incremental and piecemeal development. So in order to ensure the comprehensive development of the site, the Section 106 agreement requires the stadium to be delivered as part of these proposals, albeit that it'll be a separate application. Uh, I'll come so that back. That would be that would be signed by the applicants. Yeah. Uh, I'll come back on that. Yeah. Abbas, do you have a question? I'm completely confused now. So I thought the existing stadium was under a different application. And we it is, yeah. So how come we are considering part of that application with this application? It's very confusing because if that application expires, say in five years time, what happens to the stadium now with this application? So I, this I, is I very confusing it, now. Yeah, it's been explained once. I mean, we can only determine what's in front of us. And this is the, the, the residential development with others on either side of it. My understanding, that there will be an application for the stadium coming in early next year. So we deal with this one first and there's safeguards put in there with the section 106 that the football stadium is an integral part of the power court development site. So why isn't that application being considered now as well with this application? Because obviously that application has a major impact on this application as well. So it's very confusing. So I'm making a decision now on something that I don't know what's going to happen with the other application, which is part of this application. Um, through you, Chair, I think um, if we let the, the applicants have got their five minute, minutes, um, I think they'll, they'll explain. Stephen, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Chair. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, yeah, it's just to, to clarify, if I may, on top of what's already been said, which is, as um, Councillor Abbas has said, there is an extant permission for this entire site, which includes the stadium as part of that previously approved planning application. That stadium, part of that application, could be built. Clearly, the applicant could submit a further application, and I understand, and no doubt they will mention in their address what intentions they have in relation to any further application that specifically deals with the centre of the site, essentially where the application, uh, sorry, the stadium is going to go. Um, but the Section 106 agreement will be similar to the Section 106 agreement that was dealt with in relation to this application that included the stadium a couple if not three years ago whereby similar concerns were raised by members and similar points were made by officers whereby there'd be a section 106 agreement requiring the whole development to be built as one as per the phasing plans and the only thing i i think I'd, i would stress as per the planning officers um update the oral update which is that it's to ensure that the stadium comes forward <clears throat> as part of the entire um, comprehensive development, but also to ensure that the commercial and the community uses, which I understand are part of this application before you tonight, also come forward in tandem so that everything comes out the ground, if you like, pretty much at the same time as per the phasing plans. Thank you, Chairman. Thanks, thanks for that, Stephen. Any further questions of clarification? 
yeah, yeah, later on, probably when you've heard the applicants as well. Can I ask the applicants now to come forward, please, to the microphones? Michael Moran and Gary Sweet. OK, whenever you're ready. Uh, sorry, is that better? Okay, thank you. Um, I, I guess so. Again, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Uh, uh, my name is Michael Morin, Chief Operating Officer of 2020 Developments. Uh, the application before you is for a revised outline application for the west and east ends of the site. Um, if I may, Chair, take your take up on your kind offer just to um, take a little bit of a moment to explain and hopefully to try and address the uncertainty here. Um, the central core area and the stadium are being worked up in detail and they'll be with you very shortly. The whole reason for existence of 2020 developments is, is for the stadium. Um, and I do apologise for the complexity of this of the different planning applications. Uh, three, it is a very complicated site and we've taken the opportunity of the last 18 months uh, to reevaluate and we believe to improve. The fact that it's challenging is uh, evidenced by the fact that major property owners over the last 20 years have failed to take this forward. Uh, we're very proud to say we're on the cusp now of delivery and without the benefit of any public funds or grants. The essential change from the previous planning application that you that you uh, had before you is that in the intervening time we've had time had the opportunity to work with uh, the environment agency for example to make much better use of the river lee it's given us the opportunity to uh, continue the river lee on its natural path and open it up through the center of the site for that reason um, and, a, and also a belief for how we can redesign car parking we have dropped the podiums of the west end and the east end so now instead of uh, going up two stories to enter the site, um, the pedestrians will walk directly from Guildford Street, uh, from Church Street, from St Mary's Road, directly into the site. So the outline application now, we think better fits in line with what can be delivered and what forms part of an integrated site. The, the obvious other point to state clearly here, relocating to Power Court uh, enables a once in an opportunity, once in a century opportunity for the council and the local community to come together in Barry Park and make best use of that seven acre site that will be vacated at Kenilworth Road. Uh, so just to reaffirm the, the couple of key points of the site in front of you. By bringing the river into the site, uh, we are able to continue uh, what the council are doing on Silver Street, so it would be a natural extension. This allows St Mary's Road to come forward on its own as an additional green corridor. We've worked collaboratively uh, with all our neighbours, so the University, Capital and Regional, and St Mary's Church, uh, and we have the full support of the Environment Agency and in line with the new Town Centre Master Plan. Um, in increasing the overall number of units, we're also able to increase the number of affordable homes. And that's from 55 units under the extant consent to 240 units. All of those units will be above minimum space standard guidelines. As part of redesigning the site, a landscape master plan will be in place for the lifetime of the site. Uh, as has been mentioned, parking, uh, we're policy compliant with approximately 1,200 unit, uh, 1,200 spaces. 
Um, but we are very serious about Luton's climate emergency and we will ensure an intelligent approach to a site with such excellent transport links. Uh, finally, just to address the, the direct comment regarding the stadium, we are absolutely clear in making legal commitments as part of the Section 106 that the stadium will come forward before phase two of the residential. Um, and, and if I may, Chair, just whilst the, um, the graphic is on screen, uh, there's a slight um, error in, in what's being shown. Uh, phase one, our residential, the blue, uh, does also extend to the angular uh, plot to the left there. So the whole of the whole of um, the southern section of the west end uh, comes forward as um, phase one of residential, for which detailed reserve matters are being prepared and will hopefully be with you as soon as possible. Um, with the detailed application of the stadium coming forward early next year. Um, I think from a commercial perspective, perhaps to explain it another way, the football club is the owner and the operator of the stadium and is, uh, is able to come forward in one hit with the detail of that stadium. In redesigning the rest of the site and hopefully improving it, we first need to get a revised outline consent before we're able to submit a detailed application on the rest of the site. Um, but we're absolutely committed to that phasing plan. Uh, and as I said, the reason for our existence is the delivery of the football stadium. Thanks, Michael. Um, Chair, uh, councillors, um, can you hear me? Thank you. Um, I'm Gary Sweet, Chief Executive of the Football Club and the development company that's submitting these applications. Um, so whilst this application um, really focuses on the wider uses of power court, um, its true benefit can't be fully understood without consideration for our new football stadium, as you've recognised in your questions. Um, back in 2007, uh, we uh, and my fellow board members known as 2020 generally, we embarked upon our journey as custodians of Luton Town Football Club. Our intention was to clean it up, give it a new progressive direction, and most importantly, to use its authority to influence for the greater good within our environment. As we approach our 14th anniversary, the promises we've made, uh, we've made have all been delivered, including as a financially stable championship club by the season 2020, but also to enable the club to have a positive impact on our community and the town in all that we do. Right now we fit that we sit fifth in the championship table. The promises we uh, sorry um, uh, potentially we're we're staring entry to um, the, uh, the the top table of world, world football um, that could happen as soon as early next year. If that happens, and by the way, it will happen, whether it, I can't promise it will be this season, <laughs> but when that happens, um, it will bring huge prosperity and positivity to our town, to everybody. But we all know to stay there, we desperately need a new home. Despite delivering on our promises and setting a sound community tone, we fully understand that the true test is to get this stadium built. A question I only get asked about 100 times a week, by the way, and and this is something that we're absolutely committed to. Not only are we committed to deliver an architectural masterpiece of a, of a stadium, but we're absolutely committed to build our home at the heart of Luton's future resurgence. Doing the right thing and fulfilling our promises has always been the cornerstone of our mission. We don't get everything right, and we may have had made a few mistakes in the past, uh, but this project is so important, we're very happy to take that responsibility of perfection on this case. Right now, our designs and plans are advancing at a blistering pace. Indeed, I can advise that we fully intend to submit a detailed application to you in the first half of, of, of next year. Everyone at the club is behind its creation, and it's our number one priority right now. Indeed, by working so hard on the stadium design, we think that we've made the whole site work much better together, making it more compact and integrated to the wider area. 
the stadium will not be run, a run of the mill bowl that you see everywhere else. The value engineers, the value engineers everything. It turns back on its uh, and, and also turns back on its district. It will be unique to football, unique to Luton, uh, where it will be incorporate uh, will incorporate the very best of the town's heritage and character, acting inclusively to a greater social cohesion for the residents of Power Court and for the wider town centre. We can absolutely be absolutely trusted to deliver on this vision, and we're happy to make the necessary legal commitments in that what Section 106 agreement. Of course, leaving Kenilworth Road after mostly entertaining the townsfolk since 1905 will be emotional. But the club to, for the club to progress and for the local Berry Park community to, to further develop their region, the beach huts and the terraced, terraced house uh, turnstiles need to be laid to rest, unfortunately. So to enable us to be able to start with our spades and cranes next year for the stadium and for the wider site, this committee meeting is the catalyst for these permanent life-changing milestones. Thank you. Questions by members to the applicants. Councillor Hussain. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I called you. Yeah. yeah. Okay, sorry. Uh, can, can I ask you, and uh, uh, this was the uh, the application at 2016, both of you made a statement, if I remember it right, and it's probably minuted as well, in which you gave a commitment voluntarily that the stadium is the number one priority, and you have just said that a few minutes ago, that that is your, still your commitment. And the members' concern is not only just for the fan, but the people of Luton is to have a new stadium. Is that commitment, you said you are prepared to do that legal agreement to deliver that, is that still the same? Absolutely. Uh, excuse the terminology, but I'd be happy to sign it in my own blood, Councillor Sain. I mean, it, it's, it's absolutely, it runs through not just my veins, but everybody um, on the board and everybody who works at the football club. This is our absolute one desire that we've had um, probably since childhood, actually, <laughs> but certainly since we took custodianship of the football club in 2008. So um, from a commitment point of view, I don't think there there is anyone else that can give you this promise. Right. The second question I would ask you in terms, I mean, I think that my colleagues were a little bit confused in, in terms of the application because it would have been very helpful to all of us if it was one application because the impact on the residential as well as the stadium in terms of the highways would be huge. And what the last thing members want is to shift in the problem from Canworth Road into the centre of the town which becomes a completely deadlocked for hours and end, which is not in the interest of the residents or the town or the football club. If, so if, it, it, this is what our concern is at this stage. And I think that's what really concerns me, Bessie, that we don't want to shift a problem from one end of the town to the other end. Councillor saying, yeah, I completely understand your concerns. Um, there is no need to be concerned. I, I think that the, probably the easiest way to, to explain this is that the central area of Power Court has effectively already got its extant consent. And essentially, until we come forward with a detailed, um, uh, detailed planning application, it, there is no need to address that. So effectively, if you look at the current application that's in front of you now and add the central piece from the, the extant extent, uh, uh, consent, then that is effectively the one application. So from that perspective, in fact, what, what should you should be encouraged by here is the fact that we we have accelerated those plans for the for the stadium itself and going effectively bypassing a revision to the outline and going directly to detailed planning, which accelerates the process for construction. Next question really is in in terms of the regeneration and uh, obviously I understand the economic situation 
has changed completely, so we all understand that. Uh, but there was a lot of problems of hotel and uh, eating places and 1800 or 1500. Have I got that? I'm not too sure how many jobs were, but it was something in the region between 15 and 1800. He, how many jobs we're we talking about now? I know there'll be a construction jobs, but in the long term, you know, in, in, in the retail trade, which is probably the center is already suffering very badly. Uh, so how do you see that in this new development that in, in terms of the employment, uh, what do you see that, you know, your your development will do in that sense? Um, if I may, Councillor saying to answer that, I think the um, the first thing again, it's really helpful having the plan in front in front of everybody because it it it, it makes clear the size of Power Court. It's only when walking through it that you appreciate how big it is. Twenty acres is 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 almost uh, extending the the town centre by half. Um, what we're looking to do is is to whole wholly landscape and curate that, opening up a river, and um. I think the, the major change, as I said, is we're bringing the river through its natural path and opening it up. That will become a major feature for the town. So, and the, the central area will be comparable in size to Georgia Square. We're able then to deliver ground floor units of a complementary nature that give Luton uh, a new sense of purpose. It, it's very hard to um, it's very hard to revitalise a town without a physical fabric. Um, and I think the the, the other way, I think, just to answer you, the question that you, you posed earlier regarding how can you be certain, because, you know, uh, Luton Town and 2020 have their own, um, we have our own credibility. But I'd, I'd almost ask you to appeal to your commercial logic. We've spent um, almost the best part of a decade to assemble the site at Power Court, and it's a public record as to how much has been spent, but it, it's substantially in excess of £10 million. The, the graphic in front of you with the slightly corrected blue image, um, effectively, we've bought the entire site with the purpose of a stadium. We're only able to deliver that blue area, slightly amended. Um, it would be insane to, to have undertaken such a venture without being fully committed to the football stadium. That's the commercial logic, let alone the sort of the, the ethos of the club in being true and honest to its fans. Thank you, Chair. Um, my following from Council, I was saying, you talked about detailed plan coming to us in terms of the stadium. Uh, are you able to give timelines because it's really important? I mean, you say yes, you're you're prepared to do that. Do you have any timelines? I'm sure the residents of Luton can't wait to see a timeline of when you want to see this stadium fully built for us to enjoy. So if you can put some timelines, that will be very helpful. Thank uh, you. I will, I will. Thank you, Councillor Agby. Um, but just for a little perspective here, actually, the first time Luton Town Football Club promised or promised, talked about um, delivering a new football stadium was in 1955. So, so just uh, just to, to to draw a little benchmark there, um, we <laughs> yeah, it's been a long process um, since since we started earnestly on this project um, in 2015. Um, I, I think what what we've created is is going to be a masterpiece. Now, um, in creating a masterpiece, you don't want to accelerate that. This isn't a microwavable project. Um, so. Uh, the, the 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 correct absolutely correct answer is is you know when it's ready that's not a rude reply um, we are working harder on this um, than we have probably ever worked on anything in our lives at the moment and um, and it's it's progressing very very well we hope as I mentioned in my in my short speech that um, well I think we hope we will uh, produce a detailed plan in the first half of of, of 2022. Um, and we'll come to you uh, on pre-app before that, of course. Um, and we hope that that will be in the first couple of months of next next year. Councillor David Franks. Yeah, thank you, David. Um, yeah, back to the stadium. I'm afraid you you have um, an existing outline consent for the whole site, which includes the stadium. 
you're now saying you're going to come forward with a new application for the stadium in the early part of next year. That, as I can see it, there are three ways you can do that. You could either come back with uh, reserve matters to fill out the outline consent you already got, or you could come in with a new outline application, or you could come in with a new fully detailed application. Um, which are you proposing, please? Um, the, 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 uh, the, the plan is absolutely to come forward with a full detailed planning application for the entire central area. Um, and I think it's really important to state that within that, within that proposal for the central area, uh, all of the, the uses that, that were mentioned in terms of being excluded are being designed now so that it, it integrates with the rest of the site. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll engage with pre-app, pre um, as, as, as Gary said, pre-app consultations um, uh, imminently in, in terms of the, the central area of the site. Uh, but the intention is for the stadium to come forward in detail um, in one hit so that everybody knows exactly what's coming. If I can just say as well, I mean, the, 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 the timing of, of the delivery of the stadium is really important to us because, um, uh, you know, frankly, I, I don't want to be in a position, you know, um, where we could be promoted to the Premier League and have to uh, live for three years maybe at, 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 in the Premier League at Kenilworth Road. I think that that would be very difficult for us to do that. Um, we would be able to get ground grading consent for maybe one or two years if we got to the Premier League uh, on on a number of those those um, those items, but um, where we fall short from Premier League ground grading standards, for example. Uh, but essentially, the, the sooner the better is is is, and we we are we're pushing this as as quickly as we can, but we want want the product to be perfect. So the nose ground sharing with Watford then? Or anywhere, Dave. I think Wembley probably wouldn't have us, unfortunately. Grab us. Thank you, Chair. Um, for either one of you two, um, I mean, we keep on repeating ourselves, and I think Councillor Franks was going to ask, was going to, what he asked was initially what I was going to ask as well. Are you going to be doing a reserve matters or a new application regarding the stadium? So if you are doing phase one, the blue and the next grey shaded, the next block next to it as phase one, then you're planning to do the two blocks and the east, the, the G block and the stadium together as phase two. Could you combine those two applications together as a full application and bring it to us? Because I have some reservations around highways that lead, I mean, into the blocks now and into the stadium and the parking. You do mention 1,200 vehicles, uh, now parking spaces. So that is 1,200 vehicles, really. But then that's only 550 residential vehicles. 650, I believe, must be for football parking then, if I'm correct. Um, not not quite, but there will be some communal spaces that will be um, within the central area for, for all to use. And bearing in mind that even if there are maybe, I mean, the target is around 400, 450 spaces for the football stadium itself, um, or during the week, they'll be available for commercial, no, um, so that, commercial parking. Too. So, that for, so that brings me on to my next bit. In your original application of the stadium, you have 400 spaces. With this one now, yeah, you got 1,200 spaces with 550 for res for residents. The less, so you got 36 for commercial general and 400 spaces for stadium. So is that an additional of the stadium parking that you already got? So that's about 800 spaces. Um, if I if I can I can answer I can apologise. Um, it, it's complex. Um, um, the, the the most salient fact is that the extant consent. Um, had 1,200 parking spaces, and the, this new application um, envisages 1,200 spaces across the site. And um, what I would say, maybe to give some context, is that currently we've got a temporary car park of approximately 700, 750 spaces on the site. Um, we also have in the central area and the eastern area of the site, we have large commercial um, operations. Um, 
uh, terrine contractors do their sort of their uh, um, uh, their, their stone crushing activity with lots of HGV movements. Plus, we have a power court industrial site. So, I think working with uh, your uh, highways uh, colleagues over the last couple of years, um, we, we we honestly have been very satisfied that uh, we wouldn't have a material impact on on highways. Um, Beyond yeah, that 15, 20 minutes after a match ends. Completely different thing. So when you have supporters, you can't really can collect support of vehicles travel coming into town. Then your lorries or crushers yeah. or yeah. vans, whatever, comes yeah. into your yeah. construction site now. So, I mean, I'm very, so, I mean, I was happy with the actual blocks, to be honest with you. I have no reservations about that other than the mixed use, but obviously this is outline application, understand that. I mean, but I am very, very dubious about where you're mixing this old application with this application, and then you're gonna be submitting something in middle of June, I mean, in middle of next year, some point, a new football, a stadium application. So it's very difficult to make a decision, to be honest with you. I'm, I'm very, I mean, so I don't, I don't understand. I mean, how will you, so what we decide tonight regarding these three access roads, so you've got three access points now, Pondrick Road, St Mary's Road, and Power Court, yeah, which you could see the access points to entry. What happens when you put an application for a new stadium in next year, what will happen to those access points? Uh, I can answer that. So those access points that we are applying for now yeah. are the access points for the entire site and they, they work with the entire site. So including the new application for your absolutely, state. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and again, I think just to touch back on the uh, the climate emergency statement, that so Wembley Stadium, the most famous stadium in the country, mm -hmm. um, does not have effectively any material uh, um, uh, supporter parking. Um, and Wembley has to, used to once upon a time, but now it's in similar design to your. Abbas, can we well, not have a debate, please? Yeah, well, Specific questions and answers. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. Yeah. I think I think okay, we, if I, I'm if, happy. Just, it, just, just in terms of, of of car parking for the football stadium, we're we're very very content with the numbers that we're, we're putting forward for the football stadium uh, within the detail and that's coming um it, it actually is is equivalent or slightly actually be quite a bit more than the parking that we currently operate at kenilworth road at the moment bearing in mind you, you might say that there, there's more supporters coming to this venue but actually we uh we, we don't foresee that new supporters coming to this venue will uh will necessarily bring a car we, we're going to encourage people to travel by public transport which is exactly the reason why we're we want to locate the stadium in this in this place so we, we we operate in a much more confined space at the moment at Kenilworth Road, um, operating at, at somewhat less than 400 car parking spaces perfectly adequately, and and this the access to this particular site is much much better than Kenilworth Road. Your slideshow where you had excluded stuff off. I think it was like the third or fourth slide. Yeah, that one, that one, that one. Okay, so where you have excluded some stuff off now from this list like the hotel accommodation um the conference venues which was on the previous application are you intending to incorporate those into the new application coming next year yes okay thank you councillor gilbert campbell thank you chair I am totally and utterly confused. <laughs> we had a big planning application which we gave planning permission, outline and everything. You're now saying that you've been since 1959, you're talking about a new stadium. When do you expect to have this stadium built? Five years, 10 years or 20 years? <laughs> No. What, what, if, you want to, if you want to say it again, Gary. Yeah, what we're hoping to do is is to to put a spade in the ground next year. So uh, you know we're we're uh, you know our our absolute intent is is and and the desire to do this is not to build apartments in in Luton Town Centre. We yes we we're you know we're firm 
um, believers in in Luton as Lutonians. We're firm believers in improving our, our town centre, uh, but we're not doing this project to just to improve the town centre. We're doing this project uh, to to put Luton Town Football Club in the Premier League in a new environment in a new home. So uh, if you if you're asking for very specific dates, then I, I'm afraid I'm going to have to refer to the detail plan that will come forward. But when that detail plan comes forward, there is no reason why we can't start work on that pretty much straight away as soon as that's approved. Councillor Mahmoud to say. No, I was just to come to my in terms of the park and ride, will that be sort of done parallel with the football club park and ride? Um, I, I, I can answer that. So as part of the transport strategy, there's a sustainable transport plan that includes those uh, intercept car parks um, in order to ensure that uh, the town centre isn't overwhelmed by cars. Councillor Ali. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a quick one. I mean, I, I know that we've mulled over the whole complication of things, but out of curiosity, um, the method that you've taken to bring these applications in, um, is there any specific reason why you want to build on Block A first and then uh, the rest of it? Is there any specific reason why you're sort of like, uh, spreading the application out in the manner that you have done now? Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm very happy to answer that. Um, the, the, the first, and again, slightly confusing, the first phase effectively is block E and block F. Uh, the reason they're chosen um, is that the best access, um, the best access for the road, that they can they can stand alone while the rest of the site is being developed. Um, the intention, as I said, is that um, we're preparing detailed reserve matters for E and F. As Gary said, we're preparing detailed planning application for the for the central site. Um, I think another way to look at the, this planning strategy is that we, we could come forward with the existing uh, uh, existing scheme. That would be easier, certainly. But the reality is we think we've got a better stadium design, but particularly from the West End, we can open up the river and we can deliver uh, more homes um, within those existing parameters. Are there any any further questions? And um, Councillor Anne Donnell. Um, yes, can I? Sorry, can I just ask? Is it not possible to combine the two applications? Because that's what we're all concerned about, really. Because it's the it's the unknown about what's happening with the stadium. Can't you bring it before us? Both of them combined. Um, and can I just ask another question? Is do you have to build those blocks? to fund the stadium is that is that uh, point? no no so, so so those those blocks in terms of um capital value would be a, a very small proportion of the stadium uh, um cost and um, i think the the reality um for a site of 20 acres in this complexity is that at some point one application will always have to come first we do have the outline consent we're now starting to come forward refining the detail so um we want it's all about um, delivery and, and about certainty and so um if we were to bring the entire site in one go as gary said to work up the detail for the stadium uh, we're into next year but the intention that we're doing now in um, clearing the site in preparing the site we want to get on with it as soon as we can we'd have confirmation we'd know exactly what was happening um, though, certainly but i think as a, we do have an existing consent um, but I think the confirmation is that legal guarantee in terms of nothing else can come forward beyond that first phase of residential until the stadium is happening. So I think that's the certainty we'd point you to. Okay. Yeah, I think it's not unusual for a large site to come in sections. I think if you remember the Napier Park site, the old Vauxhall site, I mean, there's felt and count, there's four phases. Um, and it started about three years ago, and I think the, the last phase is just about to start very soon. C can I make a comment, Chair? The, the, the issue uh, is, though, that everybody here... Fine, when we get to comments, I'll make it. Are there any further questions? There are no further questions to the applicants, and you can uh, be relieved.
sit down and relax for a few minutes. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Councillor. Thank you very much. I'll move on to comments now. And Donald, in your comment. We all desperately want this stadium. Everybody here and all the residents in Luton desperately want this stadium. And we all want Luton Town to be in the Premier League. And so we're just desperate for confirmation and clarification about what's happening with that, really. I know we need the houses as well. We need the, we need the accommodation. We all know that as well. But it's just I think people are desperate to know exactly what's happening with the stadium. I'd just like to make that point, really. Hussain? The, the question, I think, in, in light of what the applicants are saying, is the, the, I want to ask the officers the question before I make a comment, please, because I didn't ask, uh, I said I'll come back on the question. Yeah. Uh, can I ask the officers, in, in light of what with the, the applicant have said, um, it, in, in terms of it would have been ideal if the two applications were to, to, together, but in, in terms of what they have given the undertaking, how strongly can we make under the 106 agreement, and I am not doubt in their work that they are keen, they want the stadium just as much as everybody else in Luton, that, so that we have in, in the two things, not only the detail a, a stadium, but also the traffic and all that, because those are the two major concerns. Uh, how can we do that in terms of the condition? Or have we got enough conditions there that doesn't need to add anything on? I'm asking your advice. Well, as, a, as has already been alluded to, there is an extant consent which uh, allows for the redevelopment of the site with a slightly different quantum of residential development, but including the football stadium. That application obviously went through a considerable process uh, of time in order to ensure that the concerns that might arise insofar as traffic and highways uh, were carefully considered. And on the basis of that consideration, the traffic uh, and highways was not, was not an issue. So in that respect, that's a material consideration as far as the determination of this application is concerned. The second point insofar as whether or not the stadium should have formed part of this application uh, is, um, is slightly irrelevant in as much that we can only determine, excuse me, football parlance, we can only play what's in front of us. So in that respect, we have an application in which we, which provides for development on the western and eastern sides of the site. The highways engineer is happy that there would be no traffic issues arising from the development. And when the application comes in from the stadium, for the stadium, uh, as it as it surely will. Early in the new year then similar process will have to be run to ensure that there are no problems as far as traffic and highway issues. So there are mechanisms in place to allow a full and detailed analysis and consideration of this application, which is before you, which is recommended, and for consideration of the stadium application when it, when it comes in, and we've heard it's coming in as a full application. So it will have to come in with all the details, again, to assure members that the traffic issues and your analogy of transposing from Kenilworth Road to Power Court to ensure that that does not occur. So that, that's the first couple of points. The second point is, insofar as the delivery of the stadium is concerned, as I said in my presentation, if this application were to be considered without uh, the stadium being part of the equation, in other words, say it was two sites, you'd be looking for a comprehensive development of that site. So to ensure that the stadium comes forward, 
the section, a section 106 agreement is a legally robust contract between the two parties. Stephen Sparshot may have a comment to make, but we are sure that it's robust enough to deliver the stadium and to give the people of Luton what they want, which is a football stadium as part of the comprehensive redevelopment of this power court site. In light of what the um, officers have said, in in principle, you know, those are the, some of the concerns. I think every member has got that, including myself. Um, if taking that into account, if this is just this outline uh, plan information for this bit, then I will support that. But I think when the detail application comes for the stadium, I still have those concerns. But I can't express that because we don't know what the detail application will be. So I, we wouldn't be predetermining that at this stage to give any opinion on that application. So on, on the whole, I will support that, in the, what, what is in front of us. Councillor Campbell. Yes, Chair. I we're on comments at the moment. At the moment, on these paperwork and the drawings and everything, I can't make head or tail of where is what, or where is Church Street, where is on Guildford Street, where is it? I can't tell. That's one thing. Now, regarding, we have a central car park that filters out into Guildford Street and whatever. And then we're going to have congestion. This is my biggest, biggest worry. The congestion that is going to create it bit astronomical because we already have problems with traffic. And with the football stadium, the, the extra flats and hotel and whatever, the amount of traffic is going to generate around that area, it's going to be a big problem. We also have a problem with the mall, where we're having shops that are closed down and it's becoming empty, you know, and if you're going to put more shops in power court, what effect is it going to have on the mall? And that's my comment. And I'm very, very worried about the old development and what it could do to the town centre. Councillor Franks. OK, where do we start? It's a major development and all major developments carry risks. As far as Luton's concerned, the particular risk is a major development in the town centre, because the town centre is a problem that many people have been trying to solve for a very long time. There are risks that the applicant may not end up being able to actually get the finance to complete the development. There are risks that maybe they've got their traffic implications wrong. Risks maybe our own highway engineers haven't quite got it right. Uh, risks that sitting here this evening, we've misjudged the application. The biggest risk for me, without any doubt at all, is that Power Court remains undeveloped for yet another 20 years and stays the mess that it's been, that we've all been staring at until we're sick of staring at it. Um, I had concerns when the previous outline application came in for the whole site. I put my hand up to vote for it, even though, yes, I did have some reservations. I have to say, I've got fewer reservations now than I had then. So I've got no hesitation in putting my hand up to vote for this to go through. Yeah, I, I, I take your point. If if how do you develop a site like Power Court, which we've seen sold on, on more than one occasion to a major developer that sold it and ran because yeah. it could not be developed?
Councillor Ali. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm only going to echo on what Councillor David Franks has already said and just to add on to the fact that, uh, you know, we've been waiting for this for long enough. And I think if we, uh, at this stage, start considering our own uh, planning issues uh, around highways, which probably the applicant has very little control over outside of their site. Um, I mean, just based on the fact that we're going to have a lot of traffic coming in, but by its nature with the development in the town centre, we, one way or another, we are going to have a lot of traffic and that's something that we'll have to uh, bring up with highways. Um, but I'm, to be honest, very pleased that we've got, uh, we're moving ahead and hearing the comments from uh, the applicant today uh, has only encouraged the fact that um, it is their top priority and they will want to go, go ahead with it. Um, the only thing I would say to them is, um, just get on with it. <laughs> That's the best suggestion I've heard tonight. Uh, any further comments? Chair, can I have one question to well, okay, a question. officer and then I'll do my comment. Okay. Can you give us a reason why page 124 paragraph 218 was removed? Because I thought that was pretty good. Yeah, the control planning zones. Yeah. Yes, because it, it actually is a, a hangover from the football stadium. The football stadium uh, included control parking zones. They weren't included in the original uh, residential element of the scheme. OK, thank you. That answers that. Um, Chair, just to finish off, um, I have full faith in Gary. Yeah, I, I, I can see him delivering it. I remember him in September 2019, but shame is it was COVID, so I can't really question him on that. You know, I'm, I'm sure if it wasn't COVID, he would have got the structure up by now. But going forward, I'm happy with this outline application, to be honest with you. And he's answered really well in his last yes to me, and that changed my mind tonight. So let's see. If, I look forward for the new application for the stadium to come forward, but I'm happy with this. Are there any further comments? There have been no further comments. I'll read out um, an email that came from Councillor Javiria Hussain, who is a ward councillor, and this is affects her ward. I would like it to be put on record that in principle, I support the application and the recommendations made by the officers. Unfortunately, I could not be here tonight because of the Tenants and Residents Association, so, but I remain fully supportive. That's from ward councillor. Right, I'm going to go to the vote now. I'm going to move to approve. Is that seconded? Seconded, sir. Then we'll go to the vote. We want to do it differently tonight because there's been a problem that when we've done the uh, vote previously, um, nobody could see on the video who had voted. So we'll do it individually. And then when you press, press, your, press your button and uh, say which way you intend to vote. Thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Agley. Four. Thank you. Councillor Ali. Four. Thank you. Councillor Campbell. Oh, my. Oh, four. Thank you. Councillor Donlan. Four. Councillor Franks. Four. Councillor Abbas Hussain. Four. Councillor M. Hussain. Councillor Massoud. Sorry, can you repeat that? Four, thank you. And Councillor Taylor. Four. That's unanimous, Chair. The door. I can't hear you with your mask on.
OK, we'll go on to the next item uh, on the agenda is that's uh, agenda item number seven, one four four to one four eight Marsh Road. Have we yeah, got the have we got the applicant present? The applicant. And we've also got a an objector. Dipon Shah. Present. OK, thank you very much. So we go straight on to the officer's report. Right, yeah, my name is Evelyn, I'm the planning officer dealing with the application. Uh, members will have seen the committee report and there was also a very brief update report issued yesterday. Um, just two things in the update report. Um, paragraph two, part three was amended just to take account of all the um, clauses within the section 106 agreement. And then um, a few words were added on to the end of condition 19 to deal with the um, implementation timeframe for the provision of the triangular pedestrian vis visibility displays. So going on to the um, application, um, I'd just like to confirm as well that the applicant for, the ap for this application is M&K Investments Limited. Uh, so this planning application seeks full planning permission for the erection of a three to five storey building comprising of 18 flats, which would be five three bed flats, 11 two beds and two one beds and two ground floor use class E units together with car parking and associated come on, and associated works following demolition of the existing buildings. Uh, the two use class E units would be on the ground floor facing Marsh Road. Vehicular access into the site would be retained as existing from Limbury Road. Four of the residential units, which is 22%, are proposed to be affordable housing with a mix of tenure. Nine car parking spaces, which is 50% provision, would have a secure, uh, would be provided on site and there would be secure cycle a si secure cycle store for 14 bikes. There would also be dedicated external amenity areas at ground level for the building occupiers. The upper floor flats would also each have a balcony. All residential units would meet the nationally described space standards. So that slide one you can see on the screen now, uh, this is the application site outlined in red, which is located on the corner of Marsh Road and Limbury Road. Uh, if we move on to slide two, the application site is situated within an established residential area. The site currently comprises of a pair of two a pair of two storey semi detached buildings which were historically separate dwelling houses but are now used as a single ground floor laundrette with a three bedroom residential flat above. A separate flat roof wraparound single storey retail unit is situated adjacent to the northern side of the two storey building and is currently in use as a clothes and fashion shop. To the rear of the site is a car parking area for 12 cars that is accessed off Limbury Road whilst the remainder of the site includes a grass area running alongside the boundary with Limbury Road. There are no significant trees on the site and the site falls within the Marsh Road District Centre and is on land allocated as District Centre frontage. Moving on to slide three, uh, this slide shows the proposed layout of the site with the nine car parking spaces in approximately the same position as where the existing car parking spaces are on the site. Also shown is the on-site amenity space for the residents in dark green and the proposed apartment building in white that would front both Marsh Road and Limbury Road. The lighter green colour is the soft landscaping that is proposed in between the back of pavement and the building elevations. The outline of the existing building's footprint is shown via the dashed line which you can see on top of the white apartment building there. Moving on to slide four, uh, this slide shows a CGI of the proposed apartment block with the two retail units to the right hand side of the ground floor along Marsh Road. The proposal comprises the construction of a block of 18 apartments to a maximum height of five storeys. The highest section of the building would be directly concentrated on the corner junction with the remainder of the development significantly scaled back on its Marsh Road and Limbury Road frontages to ensure that it relates well to the nearby and adjacent two-storey development. The elevations would consist of brick and following pre-application advice, a darker brick stock is now proposed for the upper storeys instead of a red facing brick. Larger sections of glazing have been introduced along with brick and window recessions to break up the massive development. The proposal would have a flat roof, be of a modern design with integral balconies and be built in contrasting materials. 
Moving on to slide five. Uh, this slide shows some before and after views of the application site from three key views, uh, from Marsh Road, Limbury Road and Archway Road. Um, overall, the design is held to be well considered and of a very high quality. The development would enhance the character and appearance of the area and improve views of this prominent corner site and therefore accord with the requirements of local plan policy LLP 25. The applicant has invested in discussing two pre-application proposals with the LPA, the contents of which have been addressed by the current submission. The proposal now put forward for determination is considered to be acceptable in design and amenity terms and all other aspects. The existing building on the site is not unique or distinctive and its loss is not considered to be unacceptable. Moving on to slide six, uh, the slide shows the ground of first floor floor plans. The two use class E units proposed are shown on the Marsh Road frontage, which is the diagram on the left there, those two big units on the right hand side. Uh, moving on to slide seven, uh, this shows the second and third floor plans. The third floor is on the right hand side of the slide and this shows the flat roof elements that would be present above the second floor on this part of the building uh, and this is directly adjacent to the post office ne uh, that's next door. Uh, moving on to slide eight, this shows the fourth top floor of the proposal that would accommodate one of the three bedroom apartments, balcony around its perimeter. Have you have you finished your presentation, Carol? No, no, still here. Oh, that's okay. Just my um, my my um network access went off. I thought I'd gone off completely. Sorry. I'm still going. Right. So um, I am on uh, slide eight. We were on the top floor of the proposal. Um, slide line. Uh, Slide nine, I will leave this image of the proposed development here whilst I say a few more words about the proposal. Uh, the application site is not vacant, but has great potential to aid regeneration in the area due to its prominent corner location, where a high quality modern development would be welcomed, whilst at the same time providing a valuable contribution towards local housing provision. The development would provide four new affordable homes, reuse brownfield land and improve the appearance of the site. The built environment within the locality has suffered from very little by way of regeneration and development in recent years. In this regard, the application site should be viewed as a significant asset that can be very much uh, anchor future opportunities within the area. It is an important site within the locality and therefore it is considered that the development comprising a high quality design contributes a significant benefit to both the current and the future regeneration opportunities within the area. In terms of the loss of the existing use, although the site is within, Marsh, in the, within the Marsh Road District Centre and has a district centre frontage, the loss of the existing commercial uses on the site is supported as there are similar uses nearby and the redevelopment of the site for residential purposes with a modern high quality building would aid housing need within Luton and also introduce a new development on a prominent corner junction that would enhance visual amenity within the area. The proposed mix of housing is excellent and provides in entirely for the well-identified needs of the borough. The current proposal provides a larger number of a large number of two and three bedroom dwellings which are needed within Luton. The proposal would therefore accord with local plan policy LLP 15. Four out of the 18 proposed units, which is 22%, are proposed to be affordable with a mix of tenure. So the scheme is therefore consistent with the requirements of local plan policy LLP 16. Significant weight is attributed to the quality of the living environment that is to be provided to future occupiers of any development. All 18 dwellings proposed would provide an internal floor area consistent with the nationally described space standards. All habitable rooms within the development would benefit from appropriate degrees of both light penetration and outlook, whilst the internal arrangements of each flat are logical and would provide for an excellent living environment for future occupiers. Appendix six of the local plan gives minimum standards for amenity space for both houses and flats. The current proposal has three ground floor flats and there would be safe access to the shared external amenity areas and patio on the site directly from the living accommodation. 
All upper floor apartments would have their own private balcony areas ranging from seven to 12 square metres, apart from the three bedroom top floor apartment that would have a wraparound balcony of over 200 square metres. The ground floor shared amenity areas would total 154 square metres. The proposal would therefore meet the minimum requirements um, for, um, for amenity space in the local plan. The shared amenity space would receive good levels of sunlight and daylight due to it being located to the south of the apartment building. In addition, the location of the amenity area sheltered from road noise by the proposed building would be in the quietest part of the site. The proposal contains two commercial units at ground level that would accommodate class E uses, subject to conditions about matters such as hours of operation, fume extraction and acoustic insulation, the commercial use, uses within the building would be acceptable in terms of their impact on amenity. The development is well distanced from most nearby properties, but where adjacent to the post office building on Marsh Road, the proposed building would have a reduced height of three storeys. In addition, there would be adequate separation space between the post office and the proposed building due to the presence of an existing driveway down the side of the post office. It is not considered that the development would cause any undue issues with regard to loss of light or overshadowing or loss of privacy or overlooking, so would have an acceptable impact on the amenity of nearby building occupiers. The application site is in a very sustainable location within walking distance of Lee Grave train station and there are bus stops near to the site on Marsh Road. Vehicular access into the development would be from the existing access point on Limbury Road. Local plan policy supports car-free development in areas of high public transport accessibility. However, nine car parking spaces, which is 50% provision, would be provided on site, two of which would be fully accessible spaces, as well as secure cycle storage for 14 bikes. Uh, the existing site has 12 car parking spaces. The amount of spaces proposed is slightly less. There are no highway concerns regarding the proposed development. In terms of energy efficiency, the applicant has stated that in designing the development, they have concentrated on improving U values, reducing thermal bridging, improving air tightness and installing energy efficient ventilation. All internal and external lighting would be supplied by energy efficient uh, fittings with LED lamps. Within the car park, two EV charging points are proposed together with passive provision for the remaining seven spaces. Uh, the re requirements of local plan policies LLP 25, 31 and 37 would therefore be met. As advised above, four, aff four affordable housing units are proposed on site, but if finding a registered provider for on-site provision is difficult, an off-site contribution of £367,000 would be required. Contributions towards education and sustainable travel would also be captured within the Section 106 agreement, as well as clauses regarding the provision of local labour and training and fire hydrants. In conclusion, for the reasons set out in this presentation and within the committee report, it is considered that the development comprises a sustainable and high quality form of development and is satisfactory in all aspects. The impact of the development on visual and resident residential amenity is acceptable. There are no adverse highway implications from the development. The proposal would be energy efficient and the housing mix proposed is excellent. On that basis, condi conditional approval of the application is recommended. Thank you. I'm sorry about cutting off there. Thanks, Carolyn. Can I ask that Vipon Shah come forward, please, to the desk as an objector? And you've got up to five minutes. Thank you uh, for allowing me to speak. Uh, my name is Vipin Shah. Uh, I run the post office next door to the proposed plant, which is uh, five story. I thought is far too high. Um, Basically, my issue is that uh, health and safety of the passing public using the post office would be um, a danger as well. Um, I have an um, elderly person living in my house um, with the dust created by the building site um, is not going to help her at all. We have uh, across the road uh, elderly uh, what do you call um, memorial court where a lot of elderly people live and noise pollution is the main concern for me. Um, will the council also ensure that um, the liaise with the water board if the plan goes ahead that the drains are blocked um, because there's been a rat uh, issues, rats are coming out from the drains from next door. Um, I 
how long will the building take to erect, um, which is again going to have an impact on the post office um, if it carries on for a long period of time. So we need to know the time scale it's going to take for the building to um, erect. I don't have anything else to say on that. Um, basically, five story is not at the moment. Uh, it's too big a plan to go ahead with. OK, thanks for that. Carolyn, can you put the street scene on? Um, it's in the report, the existing view and the proposed view. Yeah, Clive's Yeah, yes. So, um, yeah, yeah. First where, where's the post office regarding this next uh, door? Yeah, it's next door. So, the, if you look at the, arch, the Archway Road street scene, if you look at the right hand slide of the Archway Road, well, it's the, the little terraced um, building, or is it, it might be semi detached, but the, the, that, that two story development, yeah, next to that, where, where Clive's put the um, mouse now. Okay. Yes, yeah, so that's the Marsh Road frontage. So the post office is on Marsh Road next to it. Um, so in terms of the height, obviously the five stories is, as you can see from that, the five stories is concentrated on the corner element of um, Marsh Road and Limbury Road. And the development does um, does get set down um, as it goes towards the post office. The, the bit the bit next to the post office would be three stories in height. Um, it would have a it would have a flat roof as well, so it wouldn't be like three stories and then a roof on top. It would actually be you know um, three stories with a flat roof. Um, so the proposal is deliberately being set down you know in that location next to the post office to obviously reduce the impact on the post office. Um, and in between, um, you can't really see it very well on that on that um, image. But in between the post office, the side elevation of the post office and the and the side elevation of the new building, there is actually a driveway down the side of the post office as well. So there is like a degree of separation between the two buildings. Um, and as I've said in the report and the presentation, there's been um, various pre-application proposals on this um, site, and obviously the the proposal that's now in for you know this. Um, planning application is viewed to be acceptable in terms of its you know height scale and mass etc and its um, impact on amenity um, in terms of the second point about dust and noise pollution uh, there is, there is obviously a um, condition about a construction management plan on the on the application uh, they would that would have that would obviously deal with noise and dust you know during construction and hours of operation and that kind of thing um, drainage again there's a condition on about uh, drainage and surface water drainage and that kind of thing so that would have to be discharged by the relevant um, parties when that comes in um, and then in terms of how long will the building take to erect um, unfortunately I can't uh, answer that question uh, if it does get approval it's given a uh, time implementation of three years so they could obviously start the building at any point from you know if it obviously got approval uh, once the section 106 was signed they'd have three years to implement it um and then obviously in terms of how long the building would take to complete i couldn't answer that i'm afraid okay carolyn thank, thanks for that um any questions to the applicant first no, to, to, uh, to the objector sorry uh, dave just to clarify if you look at page 28 figure four yeah. 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 If you look at so the so you got the five like stories in the corner, the post office is in between the gap. Yeah. Yeah. It, but it, then if you look at the last building, yeah, is the same level as his, his height of his building. Yeah. So you know what I mean? So it's not five stories right next to the post office. It's, just to clarify. Yeah. I see it stepped up. Yeah. 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 Down. Uh, yeah. From from the corner. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Okay. OK, thank you very much. You can go back now. And I'll ask the applicant, please. You've got up to five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I won't need five minutes because um, most of the things I was going to say have been said by the um, planning officer very eloquently. Um, so all I would say then is that this development would provide a well-designed, distinctive building in a prominent uh, site at that location. It would provide 18 new flats, mainly two and three bedroom, which is um, the requirement of the uh, council's policy on housing mix. Um, the site's generally underused, 
um, I realised that the two retail units would um, be lost, but the development will include two new units to take their place. Um, the site's in a very sustainable location, um, and I would hope the committee would agree that it's a development worthwhile for the area. Um, that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much for being so short. Any, any specific questions to the applicant? David, you've got a question? Yeah, so I'm in two, your microphone. I'm in two minds on this. What you said about underused is correct. I do use that area very, a lot and I can see it's underused. My question is to do with the memorial opposite, how this tall building is going to affect it and the library, that area, how in terms of traffic, so that that's my worry. How is that going to go? In terms of traffic? Yeah. Um, I wouldn't, have, I can't say exactly, but there is only a, an allocation of nine parking spaces on the site, albeit there's 18 flats. Um, and that was a determined, partly I think by highways, um, to um, persuade people to not use their cars and use other forms of sustainable transport. There's, um, the, the building includes a, st a storage area for 14 bicycles. Um, there's a couple of um, EV um, points on the uh, in the parking area. Um, if more cycle space was required, the amenity area is very expansive compared, uh, considering there's balconies as well, I'm sure further bicycle spaces could be provided if that was a requirement. Just specific questions to the applicant. Abbas? Okay, then we'll, um, to, to the applicant and then we can, we can let him sit down. Is the gate between the laundry and the post office is that part of the development? No, that's on the post office. Side. Okay, thanks. That's it. And then there's a meter gap into the building. Okay, there have been no further questions for you. You can uh, go back to your seat, please. Questions? Chair, um, so for me, it ticks all the boxes. There's affordable housing. They're making a S106 contribution. The material conditions are really good. It's made out of brick. You know what I mean? So I'm I'm happy with all that. I just have one question for Chris. Are you doing anything outside? So existing road layout, the existing parking, all that stays the same. The 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 lighting, all that stays the same. Or are you changing that? Is that not working? Oh, sorry. Yeah, there's a section 106 contribution towards sustainable travel. The intention is to improve wayfinding or the links to Lee Grade Railway Station from that location. But other than that, the highway stays the same. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, that is an idea because you're, you're only f a road away. If you go underneath the archway bridge up to Lee Grave Station, I think you've got a bus stop just right next to the library there. I mean, the access is really good and parking spaces in the back there. I believe those are the parking spaces on the left hand side there. On that picture, Chris. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. And the, yeah, so I'm happy with that. Thank you. David, question. In terms of. The microphone on, please. So, yeah. <laughs> in terms of traffic again, it's a crossroad when coming from Marsh Road and then the Limbury side. There's always traffic when you're going to turn right into the new development. And I'm not sure whether you've considered the traffic because when you go on the other side towards the arch, it's a narrow road and there's always how that area in terms of traffic is going to be improved to make sure that it doesn't become worse. Because when you go there during 
rush hour or even just before rush hour, there's still traffic. So I'm not sure how that's going to change. It's going to make the place even. I mean, if you look on the Marsh Road near the HSBC, there's always traffic. So how is that going to change? It's I mean, this development will have minimal effect on traffic in that area. I understand your concerns about traffic. I, I grew up in that area and I know it very well. And uh, I think it's been like that for for a great many years. But with regard to this development and the planning application, effect on traffic is absolutely minimal. So. Uh, comments, your comment, Gilbert. Thanks, Chair. My only concern is we don't create a blind spot at the junction, and I hope that won't happen. Comments. There being no further comments, then uh, I'll move the recommendation to approve. Is that seconded? Yes, so we'll go to the vote as we did last time. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Agley? Four. Thank you. Um, Councillor Ali? Four. Councillor Bridgen? Four. Thank you. Councillor Campbell? Four. Thank you. Councillor Donnellan? Four. Thank you. Councillor Franks? Four. Thank you. Councillor Abbas Hussain? Four. Thank you. Councillor M Hussain? Four. Councillor Massoud? Four. And Councillor Taylor? Four. That's unanimous, Chair. Karen, Chair, over to can, you. I, can I ask? Now, just, just please. Members have read the whole report. We can get the highlights only, please, because we, if we read the whole report, we'd be here all night, and I have no intention of doing that. Thank you. Yeah, Carolyn, is, is the request is just to highlight the the, the sections of the report, please. Okay. Some members are suffering from fatigue. Okay, I'll try. Right. Um, shall I carry on with item eight? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Carol. Okay, good. Right, so members have seen uh, the committee report. Um, members have seen the report for Oakley House. Um, there was a very brief update again issued yesterday to members. Um, the again, um, paragraph part two, uh, paragraph two, part three um, added the word training into one of the clauses for the section 106. And there was also an explanation there about um, why we wanted the non-implementation of the previous prior approval um, to be uh, basically explained more about why we didn't want that to be implemented on the signing of Section 106, but members will have seen that. Um, the applicant for this one is the High Town Housing Association. Um, so it seeks full permission for um, 65 dwellings, uh, combination of houses and flats, um, access into the site would be off Addington Way as existing. Uh, if we go to slide, slide one, this shows the application site in red, um, which is bounded by Addington Way, Oakley Road, Ely Way and the Capwell Grange Care Home. Uh, it's close to Lee Grave District Centre in a residential area. Uh, slide two shows the existing site, which is currently accessed by a vacant 1980s uh, three-storey office block and um, a former public house called the Royal Oak. Um, slide three shows 
a plan of um, each of the two previous approvals on the site. One was the the, the, the the image on the left is for a previous prior approval for 30 flats, 31 bed flats. And the um, image on the right is a, a permission that was granted earlier this year for 49 dwellings, which is 28 flats and 21 houses. Slide four shows the current layout of the proposal, which is now proposed, which is for 65 dwellings, which is a combination of 26 houses and 39 flats. Uh, slide five shows some typical elevations of the apartments um, and there's um, balconies on the upper floors and then the ground floor flats would either have a patio or a private garden. Uh, slide six shows typical elevations of the houses. Um, all houses are either two storeys or two and a half storeys high. The two and a half storey high houses would have dormer windows in the front roof, roof slope. Uh, slide seven shows some CGI's of the scheme, um, which as you can see, a combination of houses and flats with broken up by landscaping. Slide eight shows proposed materials. Um, there's, you know, different colour brickwork and then like detailing in the brickwork as it's shown on that slide there. And then slide nine shows a full CGI of the proposed site um, as it would look from the air. Um, the site's been vacant for, for um, a period of time now. Um, as I say, the applicants, the High Town Housing Association, um, would help to regeneration, regenerate the site, etc. Uh, the existing office use has been um, ceased on the site since September 2019. Um, the loss of the existing employment space on the site is not, is not considered to be an issue. Um, the existing main, main building on the site is not up to modern office requirements and, you know, it's not viable to um, refurbish it uh, due to the rents that could be charged. Um, a marketing update has been posed, which shows that it's not, uh, there's basically no demand for offices in that area, um, especially in the state that the building is in. Uh, the proposed mix of housing is excellent. Uh, there's a large number of family homes, including like lots of three and four bedroom homes, which is um, good which means it would accord with local plan policy. 100% um, of the houses are proposed to be affordable, split between 16 shared ownership and 49 affordable rent. Um, the proposal would be very energy efficient and there's details in the report of how, um, what measures are being put forward for that. Um, the, again, the 65 dwellings would all meet the nationally described space standards and um, in terms of like immunity provision and um, uh, natural light and ventilation and that kind of thing for the occupiers that would all be satisfactory and um, there wouldn't be any other um, re adverse results as well in terms of immunity issues for neighbouring residents um, due to the the distance of the of the new buildings from you know surrounding buildings etc and um, it's acceptable in terms of sunlight daylight overshadowing that kind of thing um, vehicular access, again, as I say, Addington Way is the proposed access as existing. Uh, there'd be 65 car parking spaces, so one per unit, um, and also 39 cycle spaces in the flats. Um, bat and bird boxes are proposed within the development to encourage um, you know, ecological um, efficiency on the site. And uh, Section 26, again, is proposed with regard to affordable housing, contributions to waste, um, provision of local labour, fire hydrants, and the non-implementation of the extant prior approval. So in conclusion, for the reasons set out in this presentation and the committee report is considered that the development is acceptable in all aspects and conditional approval of the application is recommended. Thank you. Thanks, Carolyn. Um, James Holmes is the applicant. You're on Teams. Are you there? I mean, do you wish to exercise your right to speak? He's probably gone down the pub <laughs> after having his dinner. <laughs> Just send, see if we can find the the applicant first. Is he is he there? Yeah, no, yeah, Matt, Matt did say that he might not want to. It seems it's down for approval, but I've asked him anyway. Is he happy to go ahead? No, we'll carry on. Questions, questions now. Abbas? Uh, Caroline, looking at that layout there, so if you look on the right-hand side, 
that's Oakley Road, I believe, yeah? Do you have yes. any access from Oakley Road onto that site? Uh, pedestrian access, yeah, but um, not, no vehicular access. The only vehicular access into the site is from Addington Way as it is. From existed. Addington Way. What about front door, like, uh, house entrances from Oakley Road? Um, no, they're all... They're, so they're all back well, gardens. They're, those are flats on Oakley Road. That's an apartment block. So there, there is um, pedestrian accesses accesses into that block, but that's it. But there's no houses on Oakley Road. That's apartments. So where you got the grey bit going to the end of Oakley Road, that's a dead end, I believe. Then, yeah. Yeah, that yeah, bit. That's yeah, it. that's yeah. Yeah, there's pedestrian okay. access into there, but no ve no vehicles. Okay, so I saw that. That's why I asked the question: if there was vehicle access, because that yeah, looks like the, a vehicle yeah, access. The only vehicle access is in through Addington Way as existing. Okay, thank you. Any any further questions, Gilbert? Is is this the old pub that used to be on Oakley Road? Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah, the Royal Oak. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You must have used that in your time, didn't you, Gilbert? The Royal Oak. Well, there aren't there aren't any left. <laughs> any any questions? Any comments? Anne, you just beat a saying. OK, well, I just think it's wonderful that um, we've got an application that's houses. Mm -hmm. I wish it was all houses, but at least there seems to be um, at least there's a parking space for some of the flats. And I just think I'm absolutely completely support it. Yeah. So just to say that you know, it is affordable housing as well as shared ownership and is what we need in the town and uh, it meets, it's very much sustainable, it's uh, very close to the uh, railway station, legal station, so, you know, um, yeah. it, it's a very... I, I think at least three... I strongly trips. support that. Yeah. Any further comments? Just reminds me of Luton Town application. They just yeah, keep on submitting new ones. <laughs> Now this is this is this is the full application all in one go. Yeah. Okay. So I think we're we're unanimous in this. If it's an acceptable development on site, twenty six houses, thirty nine flats. So there being no further questions or comments, and I'll I'll move the resolution to to approve. Is that seconded? Seconded. We'll go to the vote now. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Agbley? Four. Councillor Ali? Four. Councillor Bridgen? Four. <laughs> Councillor Campbell? Four. Councillor Donlan? Four. Councillor Franks? Four. Councillor Abbas Hussain? Four. Councillor M Hussain? Four. Councillor Masood? Four. Councillor Taylor? Four. That's unanimous again, Chair. So that's three applications that have been unanimous tonight. How long can it last? <laughs> so we'll go on to now the um, the last item on the agenda, which, which is which is our um, planning and enforcement charter. Gary, are you are you still with us? Or? Is he with us? <coughs> Good oh, evening. You're up there. <laughs> yeah, we're ready for you, Gary. When you're ready. Good evening, I'm Gary Dunn, Planning Enforcement Team Leader. So we've brought the Planning Enforcement Charter to committee this evening with the recommendation for approval. So I was just going to introduce the planning enforcement charter if i can just get it up here on my screen okay so just to introduce the planning enforcement charter so essentially planning enforcement charters are documents that local authorities are encouraged to adopt. Um, there should be a, a framework and a guide to all things planning enforcement. And um, they should contain the planning enforcement priorities, 
the aims and objectives for the planning enforcement service, the uh, legal powers that planning enforcement have, and how planning enforcement investigate breaches of planning control. So just to move through the move through the charter. So just to work through the introductory pages of the planning enforcement charter. So essentially the introductory pages uh, lay out the aims and objectives of the of the planning enforcement charter. So the aims and objectives essentially are to provide a um, robust, proportionate, but discretionary planning enforcement service, um, highlighting that breaches of planning control are not criminal offences, and that the vast majority of uh, uh, breaches of planning control are resolved voluntarily, um, and also that um, enforcement action um, is not designed to be punitive. So just working through the charter, so then we have a non-exhaustive list of what is not, what is a breach of planning control and what is not a breach of planning control. So we just have a, have a list here which lays out um, what is and what is not breaches of planning control. So what is a breach of planning control? So internal, external works to listed buildings, cutting down of protected trees, um, any kind of works carried out without planning permission um, and so on and so forth. Uh, what is what is not a breach of planning control? So again, another non-exhaustive list. So um, things like uh, breaches of covenant, um, trespass, um, most boundary disputes, um, fly tipping, these types of things are are generally not breaches of breaches of planning control. Uh, so then we work our, work our way down to how we investigate breaches of planning control. So essentially, essentially um, to sum it up, it's uh, a, a, a kind of triage process where we, we will assess whether whether the report actually falls within the remit of planning control at all. Um, if, it, if it does, then essentially we'll, we'll carry out our checks, uh, check whether it's permitted development, whether there's any planning applications and ultimately whether it's expedient to take take action. We also highlight here that it's 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 not always necessary, um, particularly with the, the the volume of complaints we get nowadays, and particularly following the pandemic, um, to uh, carry out site visits for every single breach of control. Um, and likewise, we also highlight here that we try to encourage uh, um, complainants to access the public access system, um, considering it's also difficult to uh, to update on every single. Um, report of a breach control that we that we get. Um, so then just working our way down through the charter. So how to report a breach of, of planning control. So essentially it's mostly um, electronic now. Um, so it comes straight into the enforcement inbox. Um, we've tried to in encourage um, as much as possible, almost to a mandatory um, level, the um, the submission of photographs um, uh, that that helps helps us immensely and saves saves a lot of time in terms of investigating the breaches of breaches of control. Uh, then confidentiality, obviously confidentiality is very, very important as far as as far as planning enforcement is concerned. So we've highlighted there that um, complainants are always to be kept um, completely confidential and uh, data is to be stored securely. Um, we've then um, outlined um, three three priorities. Um, so we propose to um, to investigate breaches of control um, in line with these um, three priorities that we've um, that we've outlined. So just briefly, priority priority one for, for serious um, serious breaches. So um, works to listed buildings, works to protected trees. So we undertake to. Uh, to visit those within one to two working days, um, and that's caveated by the fact that uh, some of these works may be pre pre existing or historic, so we wouldn't need to necessarily um, immediately investigate those types of works. Um, priority two, um, th these are the kind of uh, uh, um, bulk of the complaints that we would be getting. So breaches of condition, um, works not in accordance with the approved plans, um, unauthorized adverts. So we propose to. Um, 
investigate and if necessary carry out a site visit within 10 working days for these types of types of issues um, priority three are for um for the far less um uh, far less serious breaches so um things like minor minor breaches of the approved plans installation of satellite dishes um installation of um uh, aircon units um small fences and walls these types of things so if necessary at all, we would carry out a site visit, but often it wouldn't be necessary for these types of breaches. Um, and we propose to investigate these within um, within 15 working days. And we've also emphasised here that, that site visits, um, um, particularly with the with the volume of complaints that we're that we're getting um, post post COVID as well, um, that they're not always deemed to be necessary. Um, and and again, we've highlighted that uh, that. Um, the public access system should be should be utilised for uh, for gaining information. So then, just moving moving on through the charter. So potential outcomes of a planning enforcement investigation. So we've just, um, I suppose, identified um, seven courses of um, uh, courses of action or or routes that most planning enforcement investigations tend to tend to follow. Um, so just to just to briefly briefly touch on those. So the first one is is where there's a serious breach and formal actions taken. Um, the second one where there's a, a a serious a serious breach but some kind of mitigating action by the developer is taken, i.e. submitting planning applications or lodging appeals. Um, Outcome number three, um, where there's a breach um, which is causing some harm, but uh, planning conditions could be attached to a planning application to uh, to rectify or mitigate the the situation. Uh, outcome number four, where there's 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 minimal harm and uh, a planning application would would suffice to regularise the situation, and it wouldn't be expedient to 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 pursue the issue. Um, Outcome number five is very, very similar, where there's what I guess we would describe as a technical breach, where there's a there's a, there's a breach that causes no harm whatsoever. So we we would be likely just to either regularise or, or, or not pursue any further action at all there. And then outcome number six, where there has been a breach of control, but it's become immune from action through, through lapse of time. Um, and then outcome number seven, where there's no breach of control, so we wouldn't pursue um, any any further action. That would be the end of the matter. And then we've just outlined again that nationally, the vast majority of breaches of control are, are resolved without without formal without formal action. So then we've just um, uh, added some detail to each one of these each one of these outcomes. So each one of the outcomes that I just went went through, we've just added some some detail as to to what often evolves and generally how the scenarios play play out in terms of uh, in terms of those those uh, those types of um, situations um, and then we've just got a glossary of the, um, the the most common terms used used within within planning planning enforcement so terms like expediency and harm and and immunity and then just moving through the charter, so we've got our um, complaints. So we've got the um, complaints recourse for for anybody that's dissatisfied with the with the service, um, and then we've got an enforcement toolkit. So this essentially is a link to the um, government websites, uh, which will give an, a, a full and comprehensive list of the um, enforcement powers available um, to the to the enforcement service. So. We've um, we've decided to put it in this format because essentially um, it means that we won't necessarily need to keep reviewing the um, the enforcement the enforcement charter um, legislation will change so hopefully um, linking it to the government websites um, that should uh, that should take care of should take care of that and then we've uh, then we've essentially got a list of um of, of further further reading and uh, and relevant information um with 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 relevance to planning enforcement and, and planning generally so that's that's essentially uh, the planning enforcement charter from from top to top to bottom so if there's if there's any questions uh, gary any, any questions or comments Uh, yeah, Lee Bridget Campbell. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, just, just um, one of the um, questions or complaints that, that often get raised to me by constituents um, tend to be about HMOs. Now, I understand that, um, or suspected HMOs, and I understand that 
planning permission is only required if you have, I think, seven or, or more um, separate people within an HMO. And if it's less than that, then it's, I think they need a license. Um, so my question is just simple, is, is the um, unauthorised use of an HMO covered by, by this? Um, and would an unlicensed HMO, um, which doesn't necessarily need planning permission, is that covered by this as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It will be. It will be covered by the by the charter. I think it's. I think it's there within within either the either the list of breaches of control or 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 within the, within one of the planning priority lists. But H, HMO will HMOs will be will be covered by um, by planning enforcement, and they they will fall within our within our remit. Yeah. So yeah, anything anything over six six uh, six persons would uh, would fall would fall within within our remit. Yeah. Yeah, and I think housing as well covers it with their with their licensing. Sonny, yeah, uh, through you, Chair. Just just to clarify, um, Councillor Bridgen, um, an HMO which is below um, six occupants isn't covered currently, um, but it's covered through separate um, processes through the council through the licensing. However, members may be aware that. Um, there is um, an objective that Council has in introducing the Article 4 directive um, to bring um, HMOs below six occupants um, into the planning ambit, thereby um, it would fall within. If that was to be introduced, then that is something that we could include as, a, as part of our planning enforcement. Um, processes. But it, right, a couple of small questions. Um, we have what we call loot and sheds, where people are building literally a granny flat in the back of their garden. Now there's a conflict of whether it's legal or not illegal. Can you tell me if you are going to get involved in that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Secondly, retrospective planning permission where they build something and then come to the council to try and get plan up to get it approved. Do you agree that this should not happen? Well, there's two there's 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 two things there. Yeah, I mean, your 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 first question, uh, any any kind of separate units of accommodation in within outbuildings would fall within the would fall within the remit of um of planning planning enforcement. Um, and then your second your second question, as far as um retrospective applications are are concerned, yeah, I would. I would agree to a certain extent that um, that it would obviously be um, preferential if people um, submitted um, a planning application before before building. Um, but it is it is it, it is a, a a lawful means of redress that they can submit a, a retrospective a retrospective planning application. So the the the, the planning system does allow for um, retrospective planning applications to be submitted. So it's on that basis, it's, it's a it's a legitimate um, recourse for uh, for for development that's already been already been built. Just a quick comment. HMO is five people or more or are not related living in a property is a HMO. That is the law by government. Thanks, Chair. Um, going to your point number four, um, fly tipping um, is not a breach of planning controls. What happens if we, we've given planning permission on a development and that landowner has just left it vacant and that's gathered fly tipping on that land? How would you do with that if it's not a planning breach of planning control? This is 
There's, there, there, are some, there, there are some distinctions as far as 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 far as um, untidy land is 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 concerned. So, I mean, we can take action on. Un, I think untidy land is is listed within the within the um, within the charter as falling within our remit. Um, but there's a distinction between fly tipping and and untidy and untidy land. So where where there's a where there's a property that's uh, um, uh, particularly untidy and is 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 causing a, a a detriment to the locality, then we then we can we can get involved. Um, but um, but generally, um, fly fly tipping is 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 distinct from that, and there are there are there are um, there are separate separate departments that deal with that deal with that. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Hussain, it it comes down to um, land ownership. So the reason fly tipping is mentioned and. Um, untidy land is mentioned is um, to do with land ownership. We often get complaints from residents about fly tipping, but it's on council land. And in that instance, we wouldn't be taking enforcement action against ourselves. But if it's um, fly tipping on land that's owned by an individual um, or a company, then we can take enforcement action because it's construed as untidy land. So that's the reason it's been included in the in the charter as a separate entry. OK, thank you. Could I clarify something, please, following on from what Gilbert said? Um, there are parts of the town where it's quite um, prevalent that there is accommodation in the back garden. And so you do have to have planning permission for that do you and because i've heard different versions so I'm, I'm really i'd be really grateful if you could sort of clarify i've heard if there isn't any sort of gas or electricity or water so there's no loo etc then you don't need um planning permission if it's just sort of a couple of rooms with um no utilities um attached um that that, that you don't need planning permission but would you mind um just specifying exactly what planning permission is needed, please? Yeah, so yeah. In, t in, t in terms of, of, of outbuildings and, and, and guarding buildings and so forth, it, 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 it all essentially comes down to what, what is considered to be what's known as an incidental use. So you can you can use a, a an outbuilding or, or a garden building for um, something um, along the lines of, you know, a, a, a games room or a, um, a, a, a domestic storage area or a home office or something along those lines. But you can't use it for a separate unit of accommodation. You can't use it for sleeping for sleeping accommodation. Um, and it, it, they, they shouldn't contain things like kitchens and that type of type of thing, and, and anything that's kind of representative, I suppose, of a of a separate separate unit of unit of accommodation. So, can I just ask? So, if people are definitely sleeping, um, then is that something that I'm just saying? Can they get planning permission? Can they sleep in these rooms at the bottom of the garden? Or no, it's not allowed. Well, I mean, there's always the, 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 you've always got the right to submit a planning application, potentially for an annex use or something, something along those along those lines, or even for a separate unit of accommodation. But generally, they're they're discouraged, um, particularly separate units of accommodation in within gardens and sleeping accommodation within gardens are. Are, are discouraged. I mean, sometimes um, residential annexes um, are, are are slightly more are slightly more fav favourable where they're used by by family family members. But um, but generally, no. I mean, gen generally, just a, an incidental use, which is something along the lines of a game games room or a gymnasiums are particularly um, popular these these days um, um, home offices these these types of things so um, pretty much anything that that's that you wouldn't use as a separate unit of a of a, of accommodation and, and you wouldn't need the utilities to be connected for that 
No. no. Pay for electricity, maybe? Well, you could have, you could have utilities wouldn't necessarily be... Uh, utility, utilities wouldn't necessarily be fatal to it being um, considered unlawful. You could have utilities connected connected to it. It, it wouldn't it wouldn't necessarily um, make a difference to the to the um, to the planning control um, aspect aspect of of things. I mean, there could be building control um, considerations with um, with with utilities and uh, and and and. Um, the materials that the outbuildings are made of, and so and so forth. Thank you. Okay, no further questions. I don't think we need to vote, do we, Matt? We just approve. Anybody not want to approve uh, the charter? So we approve. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, to members and officers for your persistence.